ready yet. Anyway, um, so here's another little quiz. Um, this is, we were talking about stainless steels. And this is a guide wire. Anybody ever had any heart surgery? Okay. You really um, this is a guide wire. So they, they come in through a big artery in your leg and they snake these little stainless steel wires, Teflon coated. This is an old one, it was like 25 years old. They had a problem with welding the tips. The thing is very flexible at the top. Don't, don't take it all the way out of this thing. It's, it's a pain to make it slip back in. This is just a storage thing. But they run this wire, Teflon coated, up through your vein. And this is the guide wire, which they can, um, by various techniques, I don't know. We could ask Neil, because he's a radiologist. But the radiologist, uh, the surgeon, will essentially sink these through the arteries, get something in here. Then they use this as sort of a transport uh, rope to send other things up there. They do send a balloon up there to, you know, uh, to, uh, where they put a stent in your heart or something, anyway. So this is a guide wire, and they were having problems. The wells were breaking at less than two and a half pounds, and they didn't want them to do that. This is nominally austenitic stainless steel, 304, which we all think of as non-magnetic. I showed you the thing before. This is fairly non-magnetic. This is not non-magnetic. And the reason is, this is a very fine wire coil to make it flexible. It's like a little coil spring with another wire kind of down to the center. And it was the weld between that coil spring and the little very fine wire to the center uh, that uh, was having problems. Uh, so if you want to see what it's like. I actually have a, a new one. Uh, I got two new ones because there's a lawsuit going on about some guy who supposedly got hurt during his operation. They left. They left about 30 inches of it in the cart. Uh, it couldn't do any damage, right? Yeah, okay. Um, but they, they sue anyway. They cost 1500 bucks. Just that little thing. Of course, it comes in a sterile envelope. Anybody know what this is? It's a magnet. I'll tell you, it's stainless steel magnet. So it's, but none of you grew up on a farm. It's a cow magnet. Is that? It goes to their head? Well, it goes to the water house? No, 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 no. Oh. <laughs> you make it slow. Oh, no, that doesn't melt. So. Okay. That's why they sell it. That's why they slaughter it. This is for the dairy cattle. You make them swallow this. They're bigger so they can swallow it. Uh, and uh, it goes in, and it turns out they, when they're out there grazing in the grass, sometimes they'll pick up some wire or something from the fence. It was, you know, some cut it or left around. And if that gets into their udders and stuff, it'll destroy their udders. And they're not much good as a milk cow at that point. So they basically, this stainless steel magnet grabs onto the carbon steel that they might eat. And it will hold it in the stomach. The stainless steel doesn't corrode in stomach acid, but the stainless, the carbon steel will. See, this is corroding for us, so now you know. Oh my god. Okay. That's and so good. this holds on to the steel until it corrodes. That's the way they get iron in their blood. No, no, no. That's <laughs> not but anyway, um, I just you look because you can go to Amazon and you know I I told I told a couple of people this cow magnet they couldn't they wouldn't believe it. I okay. wouldn't believe it. But they don't believe it when I tell them why how why Seven Up was named Seven Up. Anybody know why Seven Up's named Seven Up? Because it used to have lithium in it. It was an upper. You could buy it as a soft drink in the 1930s. Hmm. Okay, lithium is an antidepressant. And uh, until the government came along and said, you got to take the lithium out. They used to, you could go buy your upper wow. at the soda store. Coca-Cola and yeah. soda, man. Yeah. 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 That's right. Coca-Cola, you know, it has, has some good cocaine. Good it. not, it's not really cocaine, <laughs> folks. It's well, similar. The same point. It, it was, Coca-Cola was invented by a, a druggist in Georgia at a pharmacy. You know, they had a soda fountain. He picks up some stuff. It was, uh, anyway. That's why the former is secret. No, no, it's not true. Actually, the, the, the Coca-Cola formula is one of the, tight, the most tightly kept secrets in the world. They make a big deal out of their big vault in Atlanta. I grew up in Atlanta. Okay, I wanted to mention some things about stress relief of wells, and this applies to all wells, not just steel. Okay. <coughs> Actually, if we want to talk about stainless steels, you don't want a stress relief stainless steel. 
because if it's an austenitic stainless steel, you're going to be right in the sensitization range. Okay, and so you can destroy the corrosion resistance by doing a thermal stress relief. But stress relief in welding is needed because if I have a joint angle, no angle, and I do some sort of electron beam weld, there's almost no distortion. The stuff shrinks a little bit because it contracts on solidification. But if I have a small angle or a large angle, I'll get more and more distortion because I get a V-shaped weld, and the bigger the V, you get more contra contraction. Steel's about 3.5% contraction on solidification. Aluminum, 6%. Aluminum has much bigger distortion problems than steel. So here's another picture of, you've got a balanced weld, okay? You've got a double V groove weld, and if you just weld this way, start on one side, start on the same side, start on this side, when you're all done, even when you fill up the other side, it never comes all the way back. The V is sharper here when you're only halfway welded. Even if you do it on this side, if you alternate the weld, this side, then that side, then this, well, you guys can't always flip the ship around, okay, do that. But I, I mentioned to you how one of my students, John Galati, who was my first student ever, basically at Electric Boat developed a way to weld the tubes for the torpedo tubes, which are about you know, these tubes like 40 feet long or so, whatever the length they are. Um, and they had to weld several tubes together. Um, and he would basically balance the welds on either side. Actually, he was doing it around the circle. He might do it well at 3 o'clock, and he'd measure it and see if it's changing and not in these go and weld at 9 o'clock. Or he would balance the welds as you go around to get rid of the distortion problem. But in fact, you run into, you have a choice in life uh, in welding and distortion and residual stresses. Um, you can either have residual stresses and no distortion, or you can have a lot of distortion and no residual stresses. But actually, it's more complex than that. You don't have quite that choice. Thicker materials are so rigid and stiff that when you weld them, once you start building up the thickness, and let's say you're welding something four inches thick, once you put a two inch weld in there, it's not going to bend anymore, okay? It's got a pretty solid rigid structure. Whereas thin material, sheet metal, eighth inch material, you're welding it all in one pass and it will distort. So thin material tends to distort, thick material tends to have residual stresses. You can play the two of them off against each other by your welding sequence and whatnot. But the worst thickness of all, the most difficult to deal with, is about three eighths of an inch or one centimeter. All you surface ships, Guys, what's the thickness of your hull? Yeah, about a centimeter and three eighths. You just happen to have the worst kind of thickness in terms of you get a fair amount of distortion and you can get some residual stresses. Um, the, the, the sub guys, they got residual stresses a big time, and not a lot of people are making eighth inch uh, steel ships. Okay, they tend to grow. Um, but anyway, um, so here's actual pictures of wells that um, this is actually in 5083 aluminum and so they have a fairly deep penetrating weld fairly parallel no distortion when you get parallel size welds you get a v-shaped weld you start seeing some distortion you get thicker and thicker and you get more and more distortion okay well when you have residual stresses, you can lose fatigue strength, you can lose uh, fracture toughness, you can lose lots of things. The American Society of Mechanical Engineers, if you're building pressure vessels, uh, basically requires you stress relieve anything above an inch and a half thick. Okay? I will tell you the hull of a sub is more than an inch and a half. I won't tell you how much more, but it's more than an inch and a half. Okay, uh, knowing that, uh, how do we use these stress relief welds? Post heat. Yeah, post heat. Post weld heat treatment. Okay. And post for steel, carbon steels, alloy steels, uh, the post weld heat treatment, we preheat steels to, uh, uh, to drive the hydrogen off. We post heat them to 
soften the material if it's a really highly alloyed steel, but we also post well heat treat them to relieve residual stress. And it turns out, once you get to inch and a quarter, inch and a half, you're going to have yield level residual stresses in there. I mean, the material is starting to plastically deform as you continue to put weld beads in there. You go four inches thick, I guarantee you, you've got residual stresses that are equal to the yield strength of the material on the steel. Okay, in a complex three dimensional A crate type of structure, you're going to have high, you can be higher, you can be above yield, you can go triaxial. And so the material's not deforming, you can have stresses. If I made a, a big heavy HY100 weldment, I can have residual stresses of 120, 130 KSI in a complex shape, you know, three dimensional ribs, A crate type of construction. So uh, typically, for things that are inch and a half, the ASME boiler pressure code says you must stress relief um, to meet the code. Some rings are, how are some rings stress relief? You don't put them in a big oven. Uh, have special uh, heating elements that are bolted directly onto the hole prior to and after. That's for preheat and post heat. That's post heat, that's not post well heat treatment mm -hmm. in the 11, 1200 degree range. That's for three, four hundred degrees. That's to keep the hydrogen out, right? Okay. So you can preheat, and you can do low temperature post boil heat treatment to control the hydrogen to diffuse it out, and just put little blankets on there right around the well. You got to stress relief the whole vessel, and in fact, for thermal stress relief, they do exactly what you just said. Um, for big, this is pressure vessel shop, um, and they have. Here's a, here's a vessel, and here they're putting the blankets all the way around. After they've welded the whole thing, they're going to heat this thing up to 1100 degrees Fahrenheit in, per inch of thickness, typically. And they wrap it, they build the furnace around it. And they just have, they're like welding power supplies, just like they're preheating electric power supplies in, in the Navy shipyard, or the submarine shipyard, they tend to use electrical preheaters. Uh, so the surface ships, a lot of times you're going to use flame preheating, okay? Certainly in a commercial yard, I don't know what, what they're doing in the surface ship yards right now, but they're still using flame. But um, um, so you build, you put insulation and you build your furnace around the vessel or in some places they have huge vessels. You go to Babcock and Wilcox or somebody like that. They'll have a heat treating furnace that's the size of a two-story house, and they can put the whole vessel right inside that furnace. This happens to be a portable, this company up here, on-site stress relieving services, okay, um, will come and build a box. This is about the size of a railroad car, um, and they have a railroad tracks. In this case, the box, the furnace slides over the vessel. Sometimes they have the vessel on a railroad track that goes into the box, okay, um, but you put the whole thing and heat it up to 11, 1200 degrees. It might take a day, two days to heat the whole thing up. You only hold it there for a couple of hours, but you need to thermally stress relieve it. How do you stress relieve a nuclear sub? You do. And you do it on the first deep dive. It's mechanical stress relief. Okay? It's full of residual stresses until you go down deep and the whole thing gets squeezed. And those areas that are high tensile stress, when you put it in big compression, it causes it to yield. And the areas that, when you have balanced yielding and tension, okay? I mean, you have to have equilibrium of forces for all you mechanical engineers. You have to have equilibrium of forces. If you have tensile residual stresses here, you gotta balance them with an equal amount of compressive forces, okay? So if you go and compress something uh, at a fairly high stress level, which is a deep dive for the hull, the compressed areas are going to yield, and as they yield, when they come back up, there's less residual stress. Mm -hmm. So you can mechanically relieve residual stresses. And I'm going to talk about that more when we get to the aluminum alloys. The wings of, I told you about the Davenport, Iowa plant of, um, I think, of Alcoa, where they roll, I told you about the plate problem, where they're heat treating the aluminum plate. They stress relieve that aluminum plate, but they do it mechanically. Six inch thick plate 
10 feet wide, and they have these hydraulic jacks. I've been to the room, about half the size of a football field. Great big hydraulic jacks. They grab the plate and they pull it 3%. Start figuring out the force at 70 KSI yield. And 70 KSI, 70, 35 tons per square inch, five or six inches thick, 10 or 12 feet long. Figure out the force. It's millions and millions of pounds, or maybe maybe a million tons. I don't remember. A lot of force to pull these things apart. But getting rid of the residual stresses is something you need to do. You can also peen. We didn't battleships. We don't we don't build them anymore. Um, but um, we know they used to peen. If I went back to my remember Stout and Doty, I don't think I have Stout and Doty on my card anymore. This was the guy who talked about weld ability steels in the 1940s. In that little list of things, which if you can now get on the seller, you can there's a copy of that on there. But it says peening necessary. Well, peening is a way, peening is you make your part of your weld, you fill up the bottom part of your weld, and you come in here with a little hammer, and you beat the surface to relieve the residual stresses. When I worked at the Naval Air Rework Facility in Norfolk one summer, between my freshman and sophomore years, uh, they had a TF-30 engine, which went in, I don't know what Naval aircraft it went into. But it was the middle of the Vietnam War, and they needed to get these back so they could get shot down again, right? Um, um, so they had a shortage of TF-30s at the time, and they had completely rebuilt the engine. It was all is in the shipping area, ready to go. Some final inspector notices a crack on one of the vanes on the end of the compressor. It's made out of titanium. It's filled up with this black goo type of plastic for dampening purposes or whatever. It's titanium, and we haven't talked about shielding for titanium, but they're gonna have to, they decide they don't want to take the two or three weeks to disassemble the thing and rebuild it. <clears throat> and they need the, they needed it out there in the fleet. So they decided, the, the boss, he was a civilian working for the Navy, the boss, Roy, I can't remember his last name, but Roy, uh, I was his, there were 20 engineers and I was just a summer intern engineer. I wasn't an engineer, I was just an intern. But I was the little guy on the totem pole. And Roy says, well, you're gonna have to worry about um, this weld repair. And uh, so, uh, he explained that we were going to get an almond gauge. An almond gauge is just a strip of steel. A guy at General Motors named Almond, if you look it up on Google, had developed in the 50s or 60s. A little, you take a little strip, and if you peen the surface, if you hammer, like shot blasting the surface, you'll get a curvature from the residual stresses. And so you start with a little 16-inch thick of steel, a piece of steel. The intensity of the shot peening uh, is going to be proportional to the curvature that that piece makes. Okay, it tells you how much compressive stress you have, and it goes, it bends up when you're all done. So I went out, I spent a day, and a tech there in the shipyard, or the air rework, sits there, and he, he made up a little tool with a little hammer on the end of a vibrating uh, air hammer, and it would just pound this. It had a little ball on the end, and he would just cover the surface, peening the surface. And I was supposed to sit there and measure the height of the almond gauge and how long he had gone. Yeah. Well, well, it's on the crack on the titanium? No, it's not on the titanium. They we're just setting up a procedure okay. to do the titanium. Okay. okay. Well, the data was all over the book. Okay. And, you know, I had to plot it. It was all over everywhere. We couldn't get any reproducible. You know, press soft, press hard, you know, do it for 15 seconds, do it for 30 seconds, measure the height of the almond gauge. Tommy, you're plots it up, and it's all over the map. So I take it and show it to Roy. To, Okay, well, now go out and do it on the, on the titanium well. <laughs> they had had a guy come in, and he had welded it. He'd done the weld repair. You can see the weld bead. You can't get in there. You couldn't get in there and grind it off. We are just going to leave it there. But we had to now peen it. So now it's not just a flat surface. It's a bulge. It's got a weld bead reinforcement. I mean, when, this was thin material, so it's just a little, you know, kind of 30-second of an inch reinforcement. But now he has to do it on an uneven surface rather than an even surface, so you know that's going to make it more, more consistent, right? Right. So I had to go out and be the engineer representing, 
the engineering department and watched this guy peen it for a certain amount of time. And then I came back in and Roy says, sign this. And I said, well, what's that? He says, and he had already signed it, okay? We needed two signatures. And so he says, that's signing that we had repaired this. Well, I, I didn't know anything about welding at that point. I didn't know anything about anything. And I said, well, what happens if I, if, if I sign it? He says, well, if this plane goes down, you'll be in jail within 24 hours. Oh, so I signed it. <laughs> But, just so you know how things are really fixed, <laughs> okay, when you need to fix them, you just sort of go with, and Roy had been in the business for 40 years, okay? Um, so, yeah, we were taking some risk, but it wasn't that big a risk, and if you actually, uh, I've learned since, and realized how it wasn't really that big a risk, but you never know, I didn't know, but I sort of trusted Roy. And, uh, and actually, if I had to do it today with what I know today, I would let it go. Okay, I know enough about fracture mechanics today that I would let it go. Just a random question. In Canada, we just rewrote our uh, liability laws for, for professional engineers. Yep. And now we have a fixing of statute of limitations that you can't be held legally accountable for, you know, past, you know, I think it's 25 or 50 years, something like that. You know, once a year has lapsed, you can go and be held currently responsible for work you did 50 years before. Yep. Do you have a, any such system? Um, no, we got more attorneys than you have. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah we've got to keep them employed somehow, right? Yeah, yeah. well, I, and if they're not employed, how am I going to be employed? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, no, we don't. Um, and it's good to hear that someone's least. We do have something in aviation uh, because places, pieces, people like Cessna and Beechcraft, they're all going broke because they were being sued. Anytime some pilot does something stupid, and you have to remember, there have been lots of studies by the Federal Aviation Administration. The reason private aircraft go down 85% of the time is pilot error, okay? Uh, and then most of the rest of the time, it's the A&P, air, air, Airframe and Power Plant, the mechanic. In the aviation business, the mechanic is the A&P, stands for Aircraft and Power Plant. He's certified as an aircraft uh, technician or mechanic. And they make mistakes too, okay? Um, actually, I have something I just got. Uh, yeah, just get Someone forgot to tighten a bolt, I'm trying to remember. Just in the last week or so, someone called me up. And it's clear that, oh, it's a, it's a commercial, it's a, uh, I won't, since we're on tape, I won't say too much about what the product is. A piece of farm equipment that costs $700,000. Mm. And it only had 100 hours on it, and a bolt came loose. And everybody agrees when the bolt came loose in the engine, um, it started a fire and destroyed the $700,000 machine. Okay? The machine was only 100 hours old. They, they moved it 40 miles on a flatbed truck to a shop where they could do a teardown inspection and see what happened and stuff. And everybody finds, oh, only one loose bolt in the whole thing. And uh, everybody agrees it's the loose bolt that allowed the diesel fuel from the engine to get out on top of the engine where you got plenty of ignition sources and started a fire. And the guy was riding the machine through the fields at the time. And he got out and you know, tried to put it out by throwing dirt on top of the engine you know, to stop the fire. And uh, um, so everybody agrees it's a loose bolt. The, the attorney for the defense of the manufacturer of this machine was going to be sued for the cost of maybe we want a new machine because your loose bolt you know, leaked fuel and destroyed our machine. Uh, the attorney, um, his theory is when they put it on the, the trailer to move oh. the burned up hulk down the highway, the, the bolt, that single bolt vibrated loose. <laughs> okay. I said, that's a really good theory. So if they'll certify to that, stipulate it, I think we can go with that, that they designed, a, they now changed a, a assembly defect into a design defect. Okay? Because they're saying this vehicle that's designed to go over the fields with the engine running is going to vibrate so much going down a highway with the engine not running, okay, that the bolts are going to come loose. Right, I can, I can, I can 
be the plaintiff's expert on that one. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you got attorneys who will come up with anything. We do have in aviation in about 1992 or 90, in early 90s, they came up with GERA, General Aviation Revitalization Act. Okay. Congress passed GERA. It said any part that has uh, that's 18 years old or older, you cannot sue for a defect in manufacture. And a lot of states have laws that if you buy a manufactured product, a washing machine, and it lasts for 10 years, you can't sue for a, a manufacturing defect. Okay. Now you can go after a design defect or something if you, but you can't sue for a manufacturing defect. You're talking about professional liability, which is a little bit different. But we do have laws that limit liability for things, but there's not one that protects professional people that I know of. In fact, one time someone told me they wanted me to work on a job and they said, it was a commercial job, it wasn't a litigation job, but they said, you have to have a uh, million dollars worth of li liability insurance. So I went out to look and see, it's gonna cost me $5,000 to get liability insurance. And then I learned that that would be good for one year. And if I ever got sued, I'd have to have that liability insurance for the next 50 years. So to do this $20,000 job, I'm gonna to have to pay over the next 50 years $250,000 for liability insurance. So I decided not to get insurance, okay? And I wrote back and said, I don't have insurance. And they said, well, you're supposed to have insurance. I can't remember how I solved the problem. Sometimes I've actually told people, I'm not gonna go buy insurance, okay? One thing is I never designed a product. I can tell them what, a, what the problem is, and I can give them some options of what some, what some designs could be, but I don't make the final choice, okay? Uh, one time I was a little surprised. I had developed a laser instru instrument. I was consulting for Johnson & Johnson down here, and this was a, when they do laser surgery, they, you got metal instruments, and lasers can bounce off that, and could burn someone some part where they wanted to hit the tissue, but they hit the instrument and reflected off and burned the patient somewhere and they didn't want them to. So they were trying to design a product that wouldn't do that. So I came up with a surface coating that would absorb the laser light without reflecting. And uh, we got a patent on it. And when the patent issued, I started thinking, uh-oh, if Johnson & Johnson ever gets sued, I'm not an employee of Johnson & Johnson. I could be sued personally by the attorneys. So I ended up writing a letter to Johnson & Johnson saying, hey, I want to be held harmless if you guys ever get sued over this product. It took them six months in their legal department, but they finally gave me a copy of the letter saying, we will treat you as just as if you were an employee. Okay, they would, basically my legal fees would be paid, be taken over by the Johnson & Johnson. Attorneys, okay? But you gotta be careful about professional liability, okay? Um, I mean, we have a, well, I now have an LLC, a limited liability corporation. And so you hire not Tom Eager, you hire Eager LLC. And Eager LLC, hey, you want my bank account? Okay, you know, uh, I don't keep a lot of money in that, that account once I transfer it as an income to my personal. And I, the other thing you guys ought to know, I mean, you own a condo. If you go down here to Middlesex Courthouse and you register that as your homestead, Okay, all you have to do is sign a little form they give you um, and register it with the, the clerk of court down there if you ever do get sued for anything. Some neighbor's kid falls you know, on the trampoline and, or whatever, they can take all your assets except your house. The, the government does not want to put, make you homeless, okay? So they will protect your home. Of course, then you can't pay the taxes or anything. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you bet you'll be bankrupt, but you have a house. Anyway, um, so there are there are some laws that protect people, but um, it's actually fairly progressive of uh, Canada to be uh, uh, not of Canada in particular. But you're more progressive than we are. Okay. Okay. Um, we're way behind on uh, our legal liability stuff. So. Uh, in part because there is a very, very powerful lobby in Congress to not reform our liability laws. It is a huge, it's a 
tens of billions of dollar business for plaintiff's attorneys, okay? I work for plaintiff's attorneys, okay? Uh, I guess, yeah, okay, let me go over uh, fatigue design, which, um, so design for welds this, that might fatigue, because you have some structure that's moving, like the ship. The welds could fatigue. And there's an interesting thing, now this is, applies primarily to steels, but it also applies to aluminum alloys. I'll go over some stuff when we get to aluminum, but this comes out of a book. Uh, wrong book. Uh, there's another book like it. This is, that's one on hydrogen cracking, but I didn't bring the other book. Because um, I was using it the other day. There's one, a book written on fatigue of welds. And it's mostly steels, but um, it turns out if you look at just a single bar of steel, you will find that the tensile st the stress range for fatigue goes up with the strength of the steel. So if I got 900 megapascals, um, you can find it's about a 45 degree slope. The fatigue strength of a simple solid bar of steel is going to be proportional to its tensile strength. Um, if you put a hole in it you find it goes down, and it goes down by about 30%, okay? If you put a weld in it, you find it doesn't matter what the strength of that steel is. It's going to behave like it's a low-strength steel, okay? Putting welds in a, in a uh, steel structure will bring everyone back to equilibrium of the low-strength steel. And to give you an example, uh, uh, in 1985, Ford came out with the Aeroscar van, and they were using high-strength low-alloy steel for the first time, rather than regular old carbon steel sheet. And they designed the rear axle to have a fatigue strength that was better, that was proportional to the tensile strength, because that's what their designers knew. Uh, but that's true, that, that would be true if they hadn't welded it. But the rear axle had some brackets on it, and it was welded. And they found out people's rear axles were fatiguing off, okay, in the first six months. This was not a good day for Ford, okay? Um, and they had a product recall, so. And there was a tremendous amount of work done uh, from 1985 to 1990 on the fatigue strength of sheet metal steel welds, of high strength low alloy steels. It turns out you've always got a little stress concentration at the toe of that weld. And statistically, this little area may not be bad, but that little area is worse. And there's always some area, and you've, got, you've, you've actually got several types of stress concentration. You've got a geometric stress, stress concentration at the notch, okay, so let's, let's just say it's a fillet weld. So I've got a geometric stress concentration at both of those corners. I've also got a stress concentration because I have a microstructure in here, okay? And that steel in the heat effect zone has different mechanical properties than the steel in the base material because of the heat effect zone of the weld. So I have a metallurgical discontinuity, which can create a stress concentration. I also, at this point, which is geometric, I'll also have a little bit of slight undercutting, or um, I can have some, uh, as, the welds, as the weld solidifies, I can have some sort of little micro cracks, uh, hot shrinkage. Very, very fine, less than a human hair, but enough that you start combining all these things at the same spot, and all those things combined, you just, it doesn't do any good to weld high strength steel. If you look at the bed of a tractor trailer going down the road, assuming it's not an aluminum tractor trailer bed, uh, but uh, it's a steel frame tractor trailer, that's just a big plate of steel and they make a C, C channel out of it. So the, the steel frame is a ladder frame construction and you've got a big radius. Okay, so you've got, you've got a C channel and then you've got another one over here and that's the ladder, those are the two ladder rails and that's what forms the back of the truck. Okay. This is usually a higher strength steel, like 80 or 90,000 psi. You are not allowed to weld on that. 
NHTSA, National Highway Transportation Safety Authority, you're not allowed to weld. Now you get some guys, a good old boy, you know, comes along, he wants to add some little bracket to the bottom of his truck, he puts a little weld on there, and you know, 100,000 miles later, which is not a lot, on a uh, truck, okay, and his frame falls apart, right? You can't weld high strength steels and get any piece of feet line. Okay? You can bolt on it, they put you can drill holes in it, and you can bolt things on, but you don't weld them on. That's what this is that do they connect to the bolts then? Yeah, yeah, they're all connected to the bolts. Now in automotive, well automotive's gone to unibody construction, but some of the trucks, some of the uh, the pickup trucks, they don't have the stresses of a big 18 wheeler, right? Uh, and some of those are welded um, construction and they have ladder frame construction, okay? And so they have two channels and you know, forged, you know, tough, you know, all you know the ads, <laughs> whether Ram, Dodge Ram and Chevy Silverado and stuff. Um, some of those are welded, but they're welded under very carefully controlled conditions in the plant, okay? And they've done all kinds of heat tests and designed it so that the locations of the wells are not in the most highly stressed locations, okay? So I'm not saying you won't ever see a weld on one of these. You better not see a aftermarket weld on one of these, okay? On the big frame trucks, I've never seen anything except bolted connections, the 18 wheeler trucks on those frames. Well, actually I have, but only the ones that fail. <laughs> so, anyway. Yeah, I can remember, okay? But then that's why they call me. Okay, um, there are lots of details of wells that you know about, that you either been in the shipyard or you worked on the ship, and you have lots of different geometries of wells. This is one, which I'll show you later. They have a cover plate on something, and you're not allowed to weld around the corner like this. You leave, you just weld the two sides, and you leave that because of the residual stresses somewhere um, so anyway, there's lots and lots of well details. This book is just giving you some of them. There are sometimes hard spots. I'll bet you you have some of these types of things on you know, on board ship, where you've got something that's holding something, and you stop the weld right here. That's a hard spot. Stress concentrations. That's where the fail things gonna fail. In fatigue. Okay. Um, you got a lot of these on ships. So quick. Quick, so, yeah. point. so, in the presentation I gave, I pointed out the, the, uh, the air banks, the yeah. Easter eggs that are painted over. Um, so, when they are shipped, they're, those are made by a third party vendor they're shipped in. They have a huge circumference of uh, additional metal built onto them. So, they arrive with like a buffer zone, if you will. Yeah. So, when you put that in, the buffer zone meets up with the frame that you're pulling to. So, you're welding. So you're not welding onto the body of the cylinder, you're welding you know, oh, no. several inches removed in a circumference around it. Yeah. Right, a lot of times to solve this problem, you put a doubler plate on the shell, and the, the doubler plate will be welded circumferentially at a much lower stress because you're spreading, you've got a much larger area. You know, you're not, you're not concentrating all in one spot. And then you'll have this exact same detail, but it's sitting in a saddle. You're, you're basically putting, right. you're putting pads in the saddle, right? Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different details you can do to reduce the stress, but you don't, this is a terrible one, okay? <laughs> um, I had a situation once uh, on cement trucks. Uh, they, they have a 50 gallon tank of water and they use the air pressure from the air brakes on the truck. The, the truck has 55 PSI air to run the brakes because a big old cement truck, you even with power brakes, uh, well, it is power brakes, but it's 55 PSI air power brakes. In fact, sometimes you're coming down through uh, uh, a hill in a mountainous co country that's uh, somewhat re residential. It says air brakes not allowed, because if you ever heard the truck with air brakes, it's pretty noisy. It'll wake someone up oh. in the neighborhood, okay? So you have this 55 PSI air. Well, cement trucks always get people spill cement on them. Wet cement, okay? Important cement. So they have this 200 gallon tank of water they carry on the truck with them and they have a hose and they can pressurize it and they get 55 PSI, that's about the pressure out of your garden hose at your house. So they can take that and they can spray it off so they don't get cement caking up on their, on their truck, right? 
Uh, they also, when they really have a problem, they often carry a couple of gallons of muriatic acid, which is hydrochloric acid. You want to see corrosion <laughs> if they don't rinse it with the, the water. But anyway, so they had tanks like this, and the, the story was, um, well, one of them, a guy came back from Iraq. He was working as a welder in Pennsylvania, um, and they had a leak. And they had a leak because they had some pressure vessel tank. It didn't have any doubler plates. And I'll tell you why in a second. Um, but uh, uh, it was made out of aluminum, and they, these things would leak. And officially, you were supposed to send them back to the company because they wanted to sell you a new tank. Okay? But these things were always fatiguing. Um, uh, they're vibrating going down the road. They've got 200 gallons of water in them, so it's a big, heavy uh, thing. And they would fatigue, but the boiler and pressure vessel code, if they had some some flanges, bolted flanges and, you know, uh, uh, pipes coming out of it so you could attach things, it would leak at those wells, whether it's a well like this, a saddle weld, or whether it's a pipe circumferential around a well around a, 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 a nozzle connection, doesn't matter, they were leaking. And it had circumferential welds going around the end caps and whatnot, and, but no dumper plates. ASME, boiler pressure vessel code, um, would require end caps, okay? So you, if you had a nozzle, your nozzle, if this is the wall of your tank, and this is your penetration with a, a pipe coming through, you'd have another, you'd have a doubler plate, okay? Here's your, you got a flange on this thing, right? So here's your nozzle coming through. You got a doubler plate. You fill it well over here, you fill it well over here, you fill it well here, you fill it well here, and you don't have a, a big sharp felt well concentration right there. The double plate uh, reduces the stress. Required under the ASME code. Well, ASME code excludes water tanks. Okay? So the company out in Iowa that was making these things, not a big company, sort of a mom and pop shop, um, they look at the, uh, uh, they ask the Department of Transportation which regulates the trucks on the highways and said, well, how, you know, are there any design rules that we have to follow when we make these tanks? The DOT says, no, that's just an appendage. That's just something you're carrying. It has nothing to do with the truck going down the highway. You're not using it when it's going down the highway. It's just a water tank that you're going to use to clean off the tank. It's like throwing a water tank in the back of your pickup truck. We don't regulate what you put in the back of your pickup truck. We only regulate the truck. That sort of makes sense, right? And uh, so then they called up um, the Pennsylvania, um, the state of Pennsylvania and said, uh, well, we got this vessel here that we're carrying water. Oh, the water vessels are excluded from the boiler and pressure vessel code. You don't have to follow the boiler and pressure vessel code. So the company decided, okay, we don't need dumper plates. Mm -hmm. Now the guy making this decision was not an engineer. The company didn't have an engineer. They were building these whole trucks and they would buy their hydraulics from a company that made hydraulics. They would buy their, their tires from, you know, and everything was a bunch of components and they just assembled them. The guy who made this decision was their attorney, okay? He was looking into the regulations. He had no en en engineering training. He made the decision that just a simple little design, no doubler plates, was all they needed. So this guy's fixing some of the welds because of the fractures and the heavies all the time. Um, in fact, the attorney probably thought it wasn't a bad business for selling replacement tanks. And uh, this guy's welding on this, and he goes to check and see if he fixed the leak. And he's supposed to be 5 psi air, it was 100 psi air. He blows his tank off, the end cap comes off, blows him 50 yards away up against the concrete wall. He's in four pieces, okay? Uh, so he survived three years in Iraq, getting shot at, but he didn't survive. Uh, welding in Pennsylvania. Okay. So they looked at this later and they found, well, they had actually had, when they did, they have to do a pressure test on these tanks before they send them out because they are pressurized. Uh, they will be pressurized. And they had actually had an accident once. Okay. And they, they basically cut the guy's two legs off when it let go. Okay. He didn't get killed, they just, but he was in three pieces. Okay. Um, and they said, oh, it must have, been a, must have been a fluke. This attorney decided it was, just must be a fluke. They didn't go get a consultant to say, why did this occur? 
but they built a big cage so that all the pressure tests in the future would be done inside a big cage in case they had another fluke, okay? In fact, when you fill up the tire on a big 18-wheeler, big tire like that, by OSHA, you must do that inside a, a cage, and this cage is like one-inch steel, heavy wall steel bars. Because if that tire, if that balloon goes, I mean, people get killed when they're standing next to it. Uh, but anyway, so it turns out, it's just a, it was a mom and pop design. They didn't have a clue what they were doing. This attorney didn't have a clue of how to do engineering. And it turns out, um, uh, when we got involved in, in it, I was working with a guy in California who used to be on the main committee of the boiling pressure vessel. I was there for the welding, he was there for the pressure vessel regs. And he realized, he called it Pennsylvania. And it turns out, technically in Pennsylvania, it should have, even though it didn't come under the code, the way the attorney had asked the question of the people at the state, they said, oh, no, we wouldn't regulate that because it's a water tank. If they actually had given a, a better communication of what the question was, it turns out under Pennsylvania law, it should have been required to meet the ASME code, even though the ASME code excluded that particular application. It just happens to be a quirk of the Pennsylvania law. So it was an illegal tank, okay? The real problem was... Um, Roger realized, well, how many of these are there out there? A hundred thousand, okay, going down the cement trucks all over the country. Um, and Roger goes to his friend who's head of the National Board of Pressure Vessel Inspectors and said, we got a hundred thousand bombs out there that can go any time. Uh, we need to get them inspected. And the guy says, we can't do it. We don't have enough pressure vessel inspectors in the United States to take on an extra 100,000 vessels. Mm. So, anyway, uh, just some of the complications that occur in, uh, in, and when you have lawyers doing the design, okay? So why, did, why, did the, why did the vessel get in? Because the welding was weakening it, or, or what's a... Did, yeah, it was, it was not a great weld, but the real reason was the thing was designed for 55 PSI, and if you put 100 PSI in it, that's the test pressure. It was supposed to have a regulator on the air tank that would limit it to 5 PSI. And that tank would have taken 5 PSI, they would have found if there were any leaks, but in fact he put 100 PSI on it. Okay. Well, no one was really around to know exactly, you know, but we think he connected the air pressure, went off to do something else, and just happened to be standing in the wrong spot when it finally did let go. And it was closer to 100 PSI when it let go. Okay. But the welds were not so great either. Okay, the repair welds were not so great. It's not that easy to weld aluminum. It's not that hard to weld steel. A guy can learn to weld steel you know, to a reasonable extent in a couple of weeks' time. In fact, probably a lot of your shipyard welding programs, they go to school for two weeks to learn to weld. There are some businesses where you go to, you go to school for one day to learn how to weld. Welds are not so good. So to do a good job of welding aluminum, you probably need six months, okay? It's just a harder material to learn the technique, the way the metal flows with the oxides and things like that. Um, do a good job on titanium, well, you learn, okay? And Jack, you were the one talking about the rolling pin welders. Which are the ones? Oh, no. Who did the titanium fracking? You did. Okay. Only 10 certified welders in that whole shipyard that could do titanium, and they're trying to get two more. Okay. It can take a while. Titanium is harder than aluminum. It's actually easier to make a good looking weld, but it's hard to get a non contaminated weld with titanium. We'll talk about that. You've seen this detail. What do you call them? Rat holes or mouse holes? Okay. You don't like intersecting welds. Mm -hmm. And you can have you have to have sometimes some intersecting welds, but they actually put some little, you know, down in the, the, the structure of the ship. You basically you'd rather have a half circle hole than two intersecting welds, because those two intersecting welds would have tremendous residual stresses. It turns out this is out of the the uh, civil engineers um, steel construction manual. And there's a chapter on fatigue, and you can look at loading conditions down here, and they have you figure out whether your bridge or your building is going to get something uh, less than 100,000 cycles, less than half million, less than two million, or over two million cycles. That's your loading condition, and then you come over to another table over here, which goes on for pages and pages. And plain material is considered 
stress category A and tension or reverse bending kind of stress, built up members, um, you actually put a weld in it and all of a sudden it's down to stress level B, category B, and I'm not going to go through all the categories and stuff. This should eventually get on the stellar, I think it's gotten on the stellar, but anyway. It's in, the, it's in the structural welding code, the AWSD11, that blue and uh, red and white book. I, you, know, you find tables like this. I was just looking at a British spec uh, yesterday. That's where my fatigue book is. And they have similar types of things. So they got all kinds of different stress categories down to E and F. And you can look up the fatigue curve. I don't think I have the fatigue curves. They'll give you fatigue curves for those different categories. Uh, but then they you can go and they'll actually draw you a picture for those of you that can't understand what they meant. This is stress category A. Here's a built up, here's a built up member, here's just a simple butt, butt weld and axial tension. Here's a uh, something in bending with the fillet weld, built up member. Here's that doubler plate, but you don't weld across the front. You don't go around the corners. Okay? I'll show you why a little bit. So there's all kinds of this. This is just a few of the pages. You can usually find some sort of joint detail that's similar to something that you actually have, okay, in your structure. And it will tell you, and you can have a factor of stress could be, well, it goes from about, for a carbon steel, it goes from about 21 KSI strength, fatigue strength, down to about 7. For aluminum, it might go from 10 down to 3. You'll have about a factor of 3 in your stress that you can tolerate depending on the geometry of that structure and where the welds are located. So uh, you got to pay attention to design for fatigue. And in the last couple minutes I'll show you. This is the King's Street Bridge in Melbourne, Australia. Melbourne, Australia. The, uh, I think this thing failed in the late 1970s. And cars were going across the bridge and it's just the bridge is kind of a major major bridge across some part of Melbourne Bay or whatever. Going up, I guess it's going over Keen Street, girder failure. Uh, brittle fracture going up through here. Um, and here's your well detailed doubler plate to strengthen the bottom flange. Cover, they call it cover, cover plate here. They had had a hydrogen crack from welding. It grew by fatigue to a critical size and then bang. Okay. No one got hurt but they were very concerned. They lost a major thoroughfare for about a year. Everybody had to go to a long way to work. Uh, uh, because, and so now, since then, you're not allowed to put the weld going all the way across that because you got the weld shrinking in this direction and in this direction, and those corners get tremendous residual stresses, okay? But this one had a hydrogen crack to it. So there's certain types of details that are forbidden and they're forbidden not because someone sat there and calculated it one day, but someone just decided one day uh, to, or something failed. And that's the way a lot of the codes and standards are developed. It's just experience. Okay? Someone, we have a failure, and we go out and study why it failed, and we figure out. In fact, there's a guy at Duke University, Henry Petrosky, who wrote a book. He's in the civil engineering department. He wrote a book called to engineer as human. Okay, now he's written about six or seven books because he made he got famous off this. He was elected a member of the National Academy of Engineering because of this book. He's sort of an engineer who goes around talking about how we learn to engineer new structures from failures. So we learned a lot from the Seawolf problem. It's an expensive lesson to learn, but we learned a lot about welding high strength seals that we didn't know about. We learned about process control. The Thresher, I mean the whole Subsafe program, okay? Um, you mentioned Subsafe a couple of times, you used that term. But that came out of the Thresher disaster, okay? You know, does anybody know the Thresher? Is the Thresher the one that like got underway and was never, like on its first underway, just yeah, the same? Yeah, it was first deep dive. It was actually, it was built up here in Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And um, I was living, it was mid 60s or so, I was living in Virginia Beach. And what happened is they were they had a they had a, a surface ship. It was on its first controlled deep deep dive, 
and they, uh, they don't remember all the details. A couple of students over the years have chosen the pressure for their presentation. Uh, and they don't know exactly what happened, but it was in like four to four to 5,000 feet of water or something, or maybe 4,000 4, meters, I don't remember, but they had a hard time even recovering parts of it. Uh, one theory is it was a bad uh, braze joint in one of the seawater piping penetrations through the main pressure hole, and then this kind of four inch or six inch pipe just the braze let go. And we could talk about how the Navy in the subsafe program redesign that, but Rick Over was still, still around, still in charge, and they shut down all submarine construction for about a year and a half, two, three years, and a lot of the manufacturing management techniques that are now used in the 1990s by commercial people, the U.S. Navy developed them under Rick Over in the, in the 1960s because of pressure, but they think it was a, uh, a major penetration into the reactor compartment they lost, they lost power, they didn't have the pumps to uh, blow out the tanks, the ballast tanks enough, and they, they were on a slope supposedly coming up, because they had a tender right above them, okay, that knew what was going on, and they could hear them on their sonar, these guys screaming in the, in the sub, and they were on a, a, a slope towards the surface, um, but they hadn't, hadn't been able, because they were such a deep dive, uh, the, the, they blew the ballast tanks, but they didn't blow enough water out of the ballast tanks, and they went up and they came back down. Yeah. Yeah, so I can help a little bit with that. Um, so they, the issue, like you said, multiple raised joint failures and, and seawater and seawater systems, yeah. and they did a survey to shipyard after the fact to find out what the root cause was. And a, so, a, like, so over 30% of all of these joints were failed failing the inspection tests, yeah. but at the time there was no standard for that. So the ship was going to see with these, this condition of uh, welding joints, and the theory is you have a seawater uh, connected system aft that failed, seawater sprayed on the breakers that control your uh, RC circuitry, yeah. that reactor scram, um, so you have loss of your thermal battery, really. So the ship initiates procedures for coming shallow, which is to put an up angle and use this kind of late momentum to yeah. continue up. Um, but uh, they tried to actuate an emergency main valve sink flow, and because at the time they didn't have the same kind of air quality controls that we have for our NPC flow systems now, they suspect that there was moisture in the system. So you have high high pressure air being forced through, uh, you know, small piping froze up. with moisture inside. The pipes freeze. You can't actuate an NPC flow, so the, the air the main valve sink is never filled with air. And so you have an up angle as a result of the uh, kind of the initial procedure yeah. overcoming shallow, but failure to initiate UVC flow. And the underwater telephone that they were using to communicate with the surface ship was kind of muddled, they couldn't really understand. And then, then they kind of lost contact. And based on the data that they used to reconstruct it, um, the ship essentially kind of slipped back down. It's, so it's trying to go up, and this propulsion kind of slips and kind of plummets directly downward uh, from crush depth, breaks into two pieces in the aft portion. Really, is like a bullet and just and like a pylon just slams up at the bottom of the ocean, right. and now that's the story of the ship. So. Yeah, okay, that's more detail than I've ever heard before. But well, for a long time, some of that was a lot, everything was classified until probably the 1980s. Okay, I mean that was really hush hush about what happened, and part of it was to protect the Navy from embarrassment. Okay, but in fact, the welds were in, in Portsmouth were terrible. It wouldn't surprise me if that's not one of the reasons they eventually shut that shipyard down. I mean, it was just terrible quality control. A lot of the quality management systems that are in place throughout the United States and all this stuff with the Japanese and their quality control techniques came out of the subsafe program, okay? You would find that, that was the, the Navy was, uh, again, Rick, Rick Over was leading that and he had a blank check from Congress um, and he didn't want to be embarrassed again in front of Congress. Um, but it was, uh, it was tragic, and one of the tragedies is the people on the tender could, could hear, or maybe the phone, but they could, I think they could hear through sonar, I heard. So they could hear, some, they could hear the, a little bit of uh, underwater telephone communication. What they really heard was the sounds of various different compartments collapsing. Well, crushed up. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so... I, I heard it personally, but I heard that, that recording was actually given to most captains of the command course. And you can actually hear the captain of the thresher narrating as each water tank compartment was collapsing. So that's what was going on. Uh, anyway, you heard it before? I've not heard anything. Oh, oh, so 
I mean, the, so in, in MAPC, you didn't take annual training in which you watch a video and then play the recording of the compartment structure. 